welcome and thank you for joining me for another Traveler's Notes video. In this video, I wanted to explain where I fall when it comes to the idea of the Philosopher's Stone and whether or not it's obtainable in this lifetime. Now, for me personally, self-actualization, enlightenment, and the Philosopher's Stone or the Philosopher's Elixir, whichever way you want to describe it, since it's described as both a liquid and a solid. All three of those are very different things. So self-actualization to me is the epitome, the, the, the critical point of self-individualization. And individualization, when you hit a critical mass point where everything, you have enough experience, enough life experience to where you're individualized and you're a unique soul. At that point, you hit self-actualization, in my opinion. These are just my opinions, so just keep it at that. I'm not going to be quoting anybody or trying to buttress my opinion by saying that it's a fact. This is just my opinion. So self-actualization, in my opinion, is just the epitome of individuation. And the reason why I say that is because Abraham Maslow, right before he died, added a, another level to his hierarchy of needs. There's the peakers and there's the non-peakers. And the non-peakers don't have those moments of bliss and connection that the non-peakers don't experience. But the people who don't have peak experiences still had self-actualization. They still were living their passion, their dreams. They were fully optimized as individuals. And so that's why I say it's just the epitome of individualization is self-actualization, not necessarily um, enlightenment or the Philosopher's Stone. Now, enlightenment, I studied Buddhism for a while and I thought about being a Buddhist monk. Pretty much in Buddhism, enlightenment is subjugating the desire mind to the point where you return to the creator or whatever you want to call it. All it is, as a drop of water returning to the ocean, you lose your self-identity. So enlightenment is one thing that's like that, where you are like a drop in the ocean returning to the ocean, and you're just reabsorbed into all that is. And it's kind of returning back to an Eden type of state, returning back to innocence through subjugation of the desire mind and the will. Now, the Philosopher's Stone, to me, is something totally different. It reminds me of what I studied in the book Egyptian Mysticism by um, John Van Aken. And in that book, John Van Aken explains how the Egyptian mysticism was really a form of spiritual evolution. And that's how I view alchemy, is that it's really a form of spiritual evolution. There's a lot of crossovers, correspondence between the Egyptian mysticism and alchemy. They both have a king and queen, they both have a divine child, and that divine child is what saves both of them, basically. And they both have a serpent, and they both have birds. So the serpent and the bird imagery definitely in my opinion, came from Egypt. Now, the main difference that I see between alchemy and Egyptian mysticism is in alchemy, instead of destroying desire mind and subjugating it like the Eastern um, philosophy of Buddhism where desire is slain and the ego is slain, instead, in alchemy, the individuation process and desire are both good things. They are both things that are um, taken with us, I suppose, into the new consciousness. And the new state of consciousness is the child of the philosophers. And the reason why I say that is just like in Egyptian mysticism, in alchemy you have the two aspects of the self. The Red Queen, which would be Isis in Egyptian mysticism, and the or sorry, Red King, which would be uh which would be Osiris in the Egyptian mysticism, and then the White Queen, which would be Isis in Egyptian mysticism. And Osiris and Isis come together and, well, Isis goes to Osiris 
and she manages to create Horus, and it's Horus who saves his father and kills Set, which is the serpent, which is desire. So that is the difference, is that in Egyptian mysticism, we have the subjugation of desire again, the, the death of desire. And it is this battle between Horus and Set that defines the end of ancient Egyptian mysticism. Whereas in alchemy, the child of the philosophers is actually embraces desire. The desire has been, the ascetic nature, nature of the desire has been drained away. And the child is a product of raising up the serpent energy, turning it into that of the eagle, much like the sign of Scorpio. And it's interesting, the sign of Scorpio has that alchemy worked into it. So for me personally, alchemy is a conscious system that is similar to when it comes to the seven steps of self-actualization. It's similar in a way. That's how I knew it was a conscious system. But I think alchemy came first, obviously. Self-actualization came much later. I don't think Abraham Maslow studied any of the philosophies. He didn't seem to mention it in any of his books, didn't seem influenced by it like Carl Jung. So Abraham Maslow simply studied people that he saw that were self-actualized or he thought of as self-actualized and then listed their traits and then created the pyramid of needs. Now, alchemy is obviously an ancient teaching that comes down to us from at least the medieval times, but I don't doubt that in some way the Book of the Egyptian Book of the Dead, which is ancient Egyptian mysticism, and the Emerald Tablet are somehow connected because they're both magical documents that describe how to free the soul from being stuck in physical material reality. And basically, physical material reality is an addiction to souls. Again, this is just pretty much opinion. It's addictive to souls, and I base this off of, you know, like, um, different books on near-death experiences and astral projection. So the description is that, for the most part, souls are addicted to material reality, and we keep coming back. One of the best books is by Robert Monroe, by, it's the book Far Journeys. And that really describes how souls are addicted to Earth. It's a very interesting perspective. And so, for me, it makes sense that alchemy is really the recipe for souls to have the ability to leave Earth, to no longer have the desire mind mentality be so pervasive that they're stuck here. So that's, to me, what alchemy is. And it's a bit different from enlightenment because enlightenment looks to go back and regain the innocence prior to being incarnated. And it's a little bit different than self-actualization because self-actualization, in my opinion, is just the epitome of individuation. And so alchemy is something that I don't know if you can ever know that you reach it when you're alive. I'm not sure. I've never met anyone who seemed to embody it the way that I would visualize it, but I probably have a unrealistic perspective of what someone who was a master alchemist, what they would be like. And I have no idea how you would know that you have the Philosopher's Stone as an individual. I don't know. It's kind of like enlightenment. How do people know that other people are enlightened? Is there a certification process? <laughs> I don't know. But it's fun. And that's one of the things is that when you're on a spiritual path, alchemy has a lot to offer. There's a lot of layers to the different images and symbols, and it's fun to learn. And while it does remind me, like I said, of ancient Egyptian mysticism, and I think it's the same thing where you are creating a new consciousness, basically that when souls came into physical material reality, there was division created. 
between the subconscious and the unconscious and the consciousness and consciousness kind of took over and was all that there was until the idea of the subconscious came back into the imagination and mind of individuals and so in a way whether it's ancient Egyptian mysticism or alchemy all of it is about the return to the creator basically or return regaining immortality but not in the physical form but on a soul level and that's what ancient Egyptian mysticism is really about is it's about creating going from the Ka and the Ba the Ka being the spirit which is like the subconscious and then the Ba being um, the consciousness we're joining those together just like in alchemy the red king and the white queen join together and then a new consciousness is born that is inclusive of both of them so the higher self or the higher consciousness doesn't exist until the two halves come together and once again aside from dreams and that sort of thing and just really a lot of subconscious work i don't think that it could be determined whether or not someone had the philosopher's stone or the eternal elixir because I think the eternal elixir isn't something that keeps your physical body alive but restores immortal life to the soul which was fixated on samsara or the cycle of life and death to the point that it was just constantly recycling in the physical experience so for me the three are totally different I think that it is attainable to get the uh, Philosopher's Stone in one life but I believe that a lot of us have been working on it on multiple lives and I think that we are at a critical point in humanity's time on earth where there's so much interest in this that a um, maximum amount a critical mass of people have become individuated they've become self-actualized through spiritual awakening or through um, manifestation manifestation is very similar teaching manifestation is very similar to what is taught in alchemy in a lot of ways because it's the hermetic principle of as within so without I just wrote a um, video for the magician that I'm going to be putting together soon and I explain how you have to have not just a you know as above so below but as within is without is just as important those two together have to go together and the two concepts are really have to do with the subconscious and the conscious mind and the subconscious is our link to the I would say hive mind but that's what we're growing out of I believe and I put this whole philosophy into my book the purpose of life a brief scientific and magical guide to the age of zodiacal age of Aquarius and there's a reason why I took an entire book to explain it but we are going from a hive mind which was is part of the collective unconscious that's in the subconscious to individuation and that's one of the reasons why we see no mainstream anymore mainstream isn't going to exist anymore because everybody's become so individuated that it's not going to exist anymore there's the hive mind is gone in humanity and so there's going to be individual niches which is healthier and less controllable by the masses I guess you could say or controllable yeah by the masses or by any other power that's trying to control us so that is basically what I think alchemy is it's a method of return to a higher spiritual state of consciousness that was lost when we entered into material reality and I know that I probably used a bunch of language here that seems a little bit absurd or maybe obscure to some but I tried to explain it as simply as I could and I know that it's a very foreign idea to most people the way that I approach it but having studied these consciousness systems for so long and having studied Edgar Cayce you know read the Bob Monroe books um, 
read Journey of Souls, multiple books, I see this continuity in the story. And I also see in society this parallel to what I've been reading. Now, could this all be projection? Possibly. Like I said, this is just opinion. And maybe you understand where I'm coming from with this. Maybe not. I just wanted to put this out there and let you know my opinion. And that is it. Bye for now.